Let's stand. I just want to pray a blessing over. The Lord has sustained us. He's brought us through hurricanes and trials and tribulations, things that we would have never chosen, but we are here. And we are filled with the joy of the Lord and the hope of what he promises. So, Lord, we ask now that you take the gifts and the tithes, the offerings, and you just multiply it. Lord, as you speak through the Lifeline Pregnancy, we know that there are young women who have come forward, had an ultrasound, and I believe last year the number was 40 women changed their minds about an abortion. And so we, we thank you for your provision to Cynthia Adair and what you're doing with them. We thank you for Mayaz and Israel, the Messianic Jews that are just pouring out. They're now even not only blessing in Tel Aviv, now they're in Brazil and blessing in Brazil. And, and Lord, for the radio, the Christian radio station, Jim Stevens and Craig Thomas and all those that bring such joy, the, the, those crazy guys in the morning on 90.5. I, I just love them. And Lord, we thank you for letting us be part of that as well. And on it goes, Lord, the House of Mercy ministry, the outreaches, the jail ministries, Lord, all the things in provision that translate into the souls of men and women that are coming into the kingdom, the broken, the hurt, the wounded. God, we ask that you would continue to let us be fruitful in all that we do. And we thank you. You give us life, health, provision, homes, relationships, freedom, all these blessings that are beyond our understanding to even comprehend them all. We thank you. We bless you. Bless these now in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have the lights, the house lights, and if you didn't pick up an outline this morning from the bulletin, please get one. Um, this is one where I, I would encourage you to keep it all year. Stick it in your Bible. Stick it uh, where you can look at it. Um, when we look back over, uh, we spent a few weeks, the, the staff has gotten together, they've laid down, what is the vision that you have planned for us in the, in the year ahead? Uh, they put that together. In Habakkuk, it says, write the vision down that a runner can see it. And so I like to, uh, to reflect and journal in the morning with the Lord. And what, what is it that, um, that he had last year when we were sitting in this moment looking forward he gave us two scriptures. I don't know if anybody remembers the two scriptures that we kind of highlighted for the year. I'll give you a hint. It's Ezekiel 1.12. That's not helping. Okay. Uh, you're breaking my heart right now. But anyway, um, this is where he says, remember the wheel within a wheel. And he prophesied that the Holy Spirit, they could move in all directions and not have to turn around. So we had asked the Lord, Lord, this, the things you all are involved in and do, I mean, who would have imagined, right? And so the, we're going in all these different directions, and yet we want the Holy Spirit to lead us. The other scripture that really has taken on a whole new meaning for me is in Hosea 2.15. He will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. That has been a tremendous word for me and my family this year. It's been the hardest years of our lives. Our son died in February. My brother died in July. We lost a child. Uh, in uh, October, I guess it was, right? And so we, uh, through a miscarriage, my youngest daughter had. So it's been a, a rugged year for us, but we still have our hope. And that was such a great series of uh, w songs this morning. So when you look at the scriptures and you say, Lord, what is it that you're telling us about right now that we need to focus on going forward? The word is full of living power. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is full of living power. He knows the beginning from the end. He is the I am. So he, he knows the good works, Ephesians 2, that we're supposed to walk in from the foundation of the earth. So he knows everything about your life. I'm going to share today some scriptures that we haven't looked at a whole lot out of Haggai that just says the prophecies of God were known hundreds and hundreds of years before for the time, and how do they re relate to us even now today? And so you're going to need your outline. I want to do this quickly first. I would like you to turn over on the first page where the outline starts with 2019. This is our vision that's been here for over 25 years. But I want you to turn over. It says Global River Church 2018 in review. And I just want to hit some of the highlights of where we are. We're going to stay focused on our vision 
that we've had as a church for 25 years. I think it was, I've been here, this is my, starting my 21st year, and uh, I remember we took a, a staff kind of retreat moment, and we went out and said, who are we and where are we going? We were kind of, all of us were kind of new, and we said, well, we know what the scriptures say. Remember the one that says all the commandments and the law of the prophets hang on two? Remember what they are? Love God and love your neighbor yourself out of Deuteronomy 6, but it's also in Matthew 22. And Jesus, when they tried to trip him up, they came to him. He had messed with the Sadducees, so the Pharisees said, I will get him. They said, so tell us, what's the two greatest, what are the greatest commandments? And he said, love God and love people. And then he went on in Galatians. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, in verse 16, he says, walk in the Spirit. So we were kind of saying, well, who are we? We're, we want to be people, people that we walk in love, both for God, and we know that's a transformational time throughout all of our lives, learning to love Him. None of us love Him all the way yet, and we want to. That's our journey, and He cooperates and helps us in that journey. When we get to realize, the older I get, the more I realize how important that love, and I love what Pastor Mike shared out of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And so... We know that loving God and loving people, but if we don't walk in the Spirit, we can't do this life. You're not capable. You need to have your spirit man embroiled and in, in lined with the Holy Spirit to be able to beat the flesh, right? Because if you don't walk in the Spirit, you can't beat the lusts of the flesh, he says in Galatians 5.16. So when we look at that, the vision, we look back over what took place this past year, it's been a time of great transition, I think it was Jonathan talked about, and even in pre-prayer this, this morning, about the transformation, transitioning of what's happened. But we've had new leadership in our youth ministry, in our children's ministry, and our worship ministry is, is pretty unique right now. Um, the people who are the worship pastors over that are Pastor Willie, Pastor Mike, and myself. And probably neither one of us can carry a tune, or they wouldn't even let us near an instrument, right? But when we do know about worship... And we do know about the importance of worship, right? And so we said, look, let's just empower these amazing worshipers that we have, dancers, AV sound, and just let them go. In one of our first meetings, we said, we'll back you up. Go after the Holy Spirit. I remember it was, it was uh, Mark Lilly said, I've never had a pastor tell me that. And so uh, that's been our pursuit. And if you look at the top of our vision there on that, it says, our vision to love God love people and walk in the Spirit. But in order to make, that sounds really good, high level at 50,000 feet. Who wouldn't want to do that? Well, how do you break down that vision to have hands and feet? What are the walkout of that loving God, loving people and walking in the Spirit? Well, first of all, we did it this morning. Number one, exalt God's presence in worship. Don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? He says that in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Paul says, see, in the Old Testament, we're going to look at that, how important the temple was. When we were in Israel in November, we talked about the preparation of the building of the third temple. In the first and the second temple building, those were the places the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out, right? And so they came to a place where David wanted to build the temple, and of course Solomon, his son, did build it. But now in the New Testament, after the outpouring in Acts chapter 2, you are the Holy Spirit temple. He lives in you. No, you. Paul says, don't you know? And then P Peter goes on. He says in 1 Peter 2, right? He says, you are the living stones called together, built up as the temple of God. And when your stone is not connected with the other stone, it's just a stone laying out. What happens when you put the stones together and you mortar it all together in the Holy Ghost? You build a wall of the temple of God, and that's us. And that's what we were doing this morning. Hey, I, I have a lot. Of, I told you I've been in 12 different churches in my past, right? I, I don't think I was kicked out of any of them. Well, one was close. But anyway, but, but we have experience in a lot of different places and different and, and yesterday we were in a church, and it was there. And, but I was just thanking God for the freedom we have to be able to worship the freedom to worship Him in all different expressions. Don't you love these little ones up here? They're like doing it. And they're over here and they're doing all their stuff and they're running around and, and we have our dancers encouraging. The, what is that? We want them to grow up understanding the freedom of Holy Spirit worship. 
We're, we're required to be like them. He says, you better study them and you better be like them or you don't even get in. So put a little childlike step in you and just kind of like worship him. So part of the mission there is exalting his presence, worship. You are the temple. But, and that's really an inward work, right? But then there's this family. We need to become the family of God. Galatians 3 says, don't you know that you are the seed of Abraham and every promise you have, all those who claim him as Christ, your family. So if you've got any issues with color or age or this or that or north or south, you need to get over yourself, okay? Because it is not scriptural, right? And so gathering the family and the fellowship, being together, and then there's the training. He says, Paul says, equip yourselves, right? Study yourself to be approved, he says that in Timothy. He says it in 2 Timothy 2.15. So we are to be trained and equipped. We spent a lot of Wednesdays handing out a lot of stuff, walking through element after element of equipping the saints for the work of ministry last year. We're going to do it again. We're going to start in the book of Revelation. I thought we'd tackle a, a rough one right off the bat and go for eight weeks and let's... You help me on that one. We're going to... We, anyway, it's going to be... But you need to be equipped. You need to know the Word because the Word is what sets you free, Right? And so that equipping the saints and coming and training is very important, whether it's Bible studies or small group. But then there's, we are the hands and feet. And the hands and feet have a towel in one hand and they have bandages in another. When the broken walk in here and they're addicted or they're, bro- they're living in the woods and they come to House of Mercy or they're in the jailhouse and Pastor Willie goes to the jail or Pastor Terry goes to the jailhouse, and you hear the testimonies. My mom still gets letters from the prisoners that are there. And there's something about the, the ability of us to help the broken and the wounded, because we're all broken and wounded. We're just a little further down the pathway. And something happens in your brokenness and woundedness when you allow God to use you in the midst of your brokenness. What happens is you get lifted up and you get a revelation. If you isolate and you pull yourself away, guess what? You will go down the rabbit hole that is dark and it's sad. And so the Lord is doing something new in this. And so releasing God's love. We're a hospital and we are an army. I've had, I had a call the other night from some woman that was here during power and love. How many years ago was that? Four or five years ago, right? And so she called me from another state, nine o'clock at night, actually called Katie's phone, don't know how she got Katie. She says, Pastor, I got a son that is, he's in a really bad place. And I'm thinking, Lord, it's, I'm tired right now. And I felt the Holy Spirit said, are you a pastor? Well, start pastoring. <laughs> yes, sir. Man, I, and man, after the end of that phone call, my experiences of things I had walked through, I walked out of there. It brought back ugly things that I had seen in the past, but I felt like I was able to impart wisdom and, and direction to them. And, and after I felt, I sat down and told my wife, my wife said, I thought you weren't going to take that phone call, and I, I knew you were supposed to. And so, but she didn't sit there and say, she, but hey, praise God. What I'm saying is, we need to be available. You all need to be available. Are you hearing me? Amen. You're going to see this in Haggai. He says, get to work, and I'm with you. <laughs> I like that. That's it's like, why don't you do it, God? No, you get to work, and I'll be with you <laughs> in the midst of it. All right, some of the highlights. Not only did we have all the new leadership, it's been such a joy to have uh, Josh uh, Hildebrand with us doing communication, leading Burn Wilmington, and I encourage you to come on the, the third Friday and, and do the Burn Wilmington. Our AV sound people, did you like all of the, all the picturing that happened between Daniel and Greg and... And Jim and, and all those that have helped out, Alicia, all those that supported the live streaming. We, we invested this year in live streaming. We have people now tithing from other states and calling in and saying, thank you, other nations, right? We're about ready to launch the third set of cameras. We'll be working on that to improve it. And so God is awesome. We spent nearly $100,000 in upgrades. Do you like the paved parking lot, especially on a day like today? I haven't heard of any turned ankles since then. And so, praise God. And, that, and that's just all of God's blessing. And, and we try to balance it. What is it that you're giving and what are we doing? And it's not all about us. How do we give it away? And it's in House of Mercy, the more we give away, the more we get. 
It's, a, it's incredible what's going on with that. And the Florence recovery, good night. That just, anyway, so I'm just excited. The beach baptisms, the worship in the park, the back to school outreaches, the voice of the apostles, the Healing the Land conference was really a highlight, was it not? My goodness. And then, of course, the missions work overseas. Lord, I'm just so thankful. And so if you look at the bottom there, this is a thank you from the Board of Elders and from the staff from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you for being the volunteers and the equippers and the provision makers that help us. And we bless that you'll have a great and amazing year. All right. I want to transition now towards, you see the second page, if you'll turn or maybe it's your first page, it says year 2019, and you'll notice that we have the same high-level vision, and I've asked the Lord for these verses, and something my mom's been sharing, any of you that are free on Wednesdays from 9 to 10.30, we do intercessory, a, con- a very focused intercessory prayer, and it's the point where we come with no pre-agenda, we come together, usually we average between 15 to 17-ish that come there. The staff are required to be there. Why? Because it's where we get our directions from him. Amen. We immediately go from there to the administrative meeting, which is our, our staff meeting, and uh, we lay out administratively what are we doing, how we do, what's the Lord saying. But there's something about intercession, prayer time, where you come as a corporate body. In a family, I encourage you, children, Husbands, wives, if you're single, get someone that you're in connected with. I love Ron every morning at around 7 or 7.05, I can hear bing on my phone. I said, that's Ron. And it's been, it's been ongoing. The, out, the, the outpouring of this week has all been about Bill Johnson sharing how prior revivalists have been poured out and how the Holy Spirit got a hold of Finney and how he touched him and walked in a factory and people fell out in the factory, started crying. Or John G. Lake, who had completely turned Seattle, Washington right side up. Healings. And they all contributed back to the day when they pursued and sought the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit fell on them, their ministry and their lives changed. I'm telling you. So there's something about intercession and coming together. Again, if you isolate, you're isolated. The world will pull you in every direction. But you come together, your living stone partnered with other living stones, mortared all together in the Holy Ghost, you get downloads. We get direction. We get insight. Things come out. Themes come out of them. It's like what happens in this morning. As the team was, was uh, sharing this morning, practicing, they were singing that song, I'm doing a new thing. Or, and you look on the bulletin, front page, new thing. And so it's like, Holy Spirit, I love the way you do this. If we just cooperate with you. And so... As we look forward, the the high-level stuff is there in 2019, but I want to look at some of the specific verses that I believe will be relevant. I want to make it relevant, and so let me start with first, the first part of this is going to be a Bible study. Are you okay with that? We'll do a little bit of a Bible study, and then we'll transition into application, sermonette kind of a deal, but first of all, let me ask you if you would turn with me. Probably some scriptures we don't often deal into, but let me ask you to turn to uh, number one will be Ezra chapter one. In Ezra chapter one. Okay, put put a little thingy there, because I know trying to find Ezra is like, huh? <laughs> What was that? Ezra. Put a little marker there because we're going to reflect back and then turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 25. Two scriptures. And I know if you've got a phone, it's a little more difficult, but we'll, I just, call me old-fashioned, I just, I just love these things. They're called books. And uh, you, can, you can write on them, highlight them. I find stuff from years and years ago. It's like, God, mm, love it. Anyway, that's just me. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 25. Let me, let me ask a couple of questions here. If you look at history now, let me do a quick history, uh, kind of get us all together. You had the prophet Isaiah, and then you had 
Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. So they kind of followed in, in suit. 150 years before King Cyrus was born, Isaiah prophesied there would be a king named Cyrus. He would be a Persian king. Anybody tell me who the Jews believe the day, the modern day Cyrus is? Trump. When we were in Israel, they said, Trump is Cyrus. I said, what, what? And so when we talked to our... See, there was a prophecy by Isaiah 150 years. Now, think about this. Nebuchadnezzar, here's the history. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the Babylonians. Remember Daniel? They're in captivity. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, shows the, the, the tall character. And he says, the, the first leader of the, of the, of the world is going to be you, Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians were the world power of the day. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king over all of that. Well, 150 years prior to the next major world power coming is Isaiah, and he prophesies Persia is going to come and destroy the Babylonians. There won't be anything left. He says, because of the Babylonians' uh, harm that they did to Israel. If you harm Israel, you're toast. You tell me one nation that has harmed Israel that is still around historically. They're the only ones, right? That's why Genesis 12, 3 says, those who bless Israel be blessed. Those who curse her, you're cursed. And so we know that Isaiah, he prophesied, and here they're in captivity. So here's, here's what happens. The Israel, the Israel is warned over and again by the prophets, stop all your evil works. Stop it. All your idolatry going after false gods, not honoring me, holding back all of your, your commandments toward you. I've, I've given you time after time after time. And because you have failed to listen to my prophets, you will now reap the whirlwind. Wake up, America, okay? And so they, what we see here in Jeremiah 25 is they are going to be, it's prophesied by Jeremiah, they're going to go into, 20, into 70 years of captivity. So look at verse 1, Jeremiah 25, 1. My Bible titles it 70 years of captivity. This message is for all the people of Judah came, came to Jeremiah from the Lord during the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign over Judah. This was the year when King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians began his reign. Jeremiah the prophet said to all the people in Judah and Jerusalem, for the past 23 years from the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, and king of Judah until now, the Lord has been giving me this message. I have faithfully passed this on to you, but you would not listen. 23 years prophetically, he warned them. Again and again, the Lord has sent you his servants, the prophets, but you have not listened or even paid attention. Each time the message was this, turn from the evil road that you're traveling. You could say, consider your ways. And then I will let you live in this land that the Lord gave you and your ancestors forever. Do not provoke my anger by worshiping idols that you made with your own hands. Then I will not harm you. But you would not listen to me, says the Lord. You made me furious by worshiping idols you made with your own hands, bringing yourselves all the disasters that you now suffer. And now the Lord's of heaven armies says, because you have not listened, I will gather the armies of the north under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Now, this is prophesied. This hadn't happened yet. And I have appointed him as my deputy, and I will bring him against the land. I will completely destroy you as an object of horror and contempt. This is the destruction of the first temple. Solomon had built this temple. It was the most incredible. Remember, David had reigned. He turned his rule and reign to Solomon, his son, and now What's happened is they have turned away. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom was split, and they are now walking in all forms of evil. This is the destruction of the first temple. I will take away your happy singing and your laughter. Look at verse 12. Then after 70 years of captivity is over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord. I will make the country of the Babylonians a wasteland. You know what's so amazing to me? When we were in Israel, we went to the, book, the Museum of the Book. They had pulled up from the Dead Sea Scrolls this book, many copies of the book of Isaiah, all of the Old Testament, so, and all of it's validated 
set aside for over 2,000 years so we could bring a group of people together and they could translate and said, guess what? That which was written back then is still valid today. They didn't write it after the fact. If that doesn't get you, it's like, you better think there's a God that's written this book because it is true. And when there's a prophecy beforehand, it says, you're going to spend 70 years because of your wickedness and then I'm going to destroy the one who came after you and I'm going to raise up a King Cyrus. Okay. Turn with me now back to Ezra, chapter 1. After the captivity, there's a prophecy that says you're going to go back and actually you're going to rebuild the temple, temple number 2. So in Ezra, chapter 1, he was a, he was a priest. and says In verse 1, it says, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia. Now, this is now 150 years after Isaiah prophesied, and this is the place where now the king of Persia is the world power, and Cyrus is in power. He says, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy that he had given to Jeremiah, which we read out of, out of Jeremiah 25. He stirred the, height of, the heart of Cyrus to put the proclamation in writing and send it throughout the kingdom. So, so get this picture. They're in captivity. Daniel's been there. Remember what happened the night when Daniel had the writing on the wall and the kingdom fell and Nebuchadnezzar's son ruling and reigning, he was destroyed and the Persians conquered it and the Persians become the world power. King Cyrus is now king over the world. But he's got these Jews living among him that the Babylonians had brought and they pull out a scroll written 150 years prior by the prophet Isaiah that says there will be a king and his name will be Cyrus and I know him by name and he will rebuild and allow those in exile to go back and rebuild it. Now, if that doesn't get... Now, can you imagine? They don't have internet or any of that stuff, right? So they pull out this old Jewish scroll and they bring it to King Cyrus and they said, do you know that you've been prophesied in this? What? And he he looks at this And it says this, and then he makes a decree. Let's look at the decree, and then we'll go look at what Isaiah said. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. He makes a declaration. The Lord of God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem and Judah, rebuild his temple of the Lord, the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute. What? Contribute to their expenses by giving them silver, gold, supplies for the journey, livestock, and a well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. The king puts that decree out. Okay. I know. Hang with me. Bible study. Turn with me now to Isaiah 45. This, they found... I think it was over six or seven complete copies of the book of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so this is like, I love this. He says, here, get this picture now. Isaiah, he was a strange prophet. He was, he was a wild prophet. <laughs> but he's the one who also prophesied about a virgin that would become with child, right? Would ride on a donkey colt, come into Jerusalem. They would call him Emmanuel. Yeah, and they're, they're like, what? A bird? What's wrong? Well, here he is now, 150 years earlier, he writes this, verse 1, Isaiah 45, 1. Thus, well, let's look and let's step up a couple of verses before that. In 44, let's look at verse 28. Isaiah 44, 28. Thus saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thou foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, 45.1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of the kings, to open before him the two leaven gates and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the brass of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, the hidden riches of the secret places, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord, which thou calleth by name. I am he, the God of Israel, and Jacob my servant, and Israel my elect, 
I have chosen thee, called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee enough, though, that thou hast not known me. Can you imagine being a king? They pull out the old scrolls, and they say, by the way, this was written 150 years ago. You're a pagan king. God's called you by name. You may have a billionaire playboy that's now in the White House, or was, But if he's been called by God to drain the swamp and do the things that he said and to bless Israel and move the, the, ah, all those things that he's doing, it's like, man, is there controversy around this dude? You can bet those who had enslaved the Israelis back under Cyrus when he said, you better give them silver and gold and you better make a way for them. You think that went over well? You talk about reconstruction during the, after the Civil War? Come on. Put yourself in that place. It's like, this is not, this is like, whoa, he's probably not well liked. But you probably don't open your mouth because you don't lose your head in a democracy. Well, probably not. But anyway, so we see that this is the call. So in Ezra and in Jeremiah and in Isaiah, the prophecy. All right. Now, let's pick up from here. Right after this, they go, they get Ezra and 50,000 Jews migrate. It's not an easy migration to go from Persia, Babylon, the conquering of that, into Israel. So turn with me to Haggai. So Haggai. Okay, go to the right towards the New Testament. You got Jonah, Micah, Zephaniah, and Haggai. It's only two chapters right before Zechariah. If you look at the progression of time here, where are we? They've now been exiled. Isaiah prophesied. Jeremiah prophesied. Ezekiel prophesied. And now you have the place where they've been released by Cyrus. They migrate. And after the decree we read in Ezra chapter 1 from the king, two years later, you got 50,000 Jews in Jerusalem. And in Israel. And it's a mess. It's been completely destroyed. And so can you imagine taking your families, migrating, right? Not by plane, but by foot and horseback or donkey, right? Getting there, and you gotta build, you gotta build, you gotta, you gotta do it, all that stuff. I don't care if you get gold and silver, but you still gotta build. So they decide, look, let's go ahead and let's start right on the temple. So they lay the foundation of the temple and they start building. And guess what? They get overcome by a whole bunch of other activity things that need to happen. Now you got to plant your gardens. you got to take care of your kids. You know, all of that's happening, and they lose the focus on the temple. And 16 years go by. And God is not really happy that they have forgotten about his temple. So he raises up a couple other prophets. You end up, there's actually three now. Remember, These are the only surviving prophets at this time. You got Haggai. He's probably in his mid-70s, they think, maybe close to 80. Zechariah, who's a young prophet, and he's going to, we've read out of Zechariah. If you've never read Zechariah, I would start your year reading the book of Zechariah, 14 chapters. It prophesies 600 years before Christ, the coming of the first Christ, the restoration of Israel, the second coming of Christ. And then the final, all it's, it's an amazing book about what was prophesied, again, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So here we are. You got Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They are not doing what God called them to do. He raised up Cyrus, gave them permission, gave them provision, and they're working on building their houses. So we got a lot of work to do, so let, they don't worry about the church anymore. And so the Lord says, I'm going to raise up a guy named Haggai. He was there. They believe he saw Solomon's temple. They believe he was part of the exile group who's now old enough, and he's passing on the mantle to Zechariah, and he remembers Solomon's temple. And here's what he does. You read it? I'm going to read this to you. We've got a little time, so just kind of bear with it. They're not long chapters, but let's... Calling to the building of the temple... On August 29th of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord gave a message to the prophet Haggai and to Zerubbabel, the son of Zeltiel, governor of Judah. So 
you have both a priest named Jeshua and also the governor. So you have the government official and you have the high priest. And the prophet steps in and says, I got a word for both you guys. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army, Haggai 1-2, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. I think he says that 29 times in some form. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. Heaven's army says. Lord says. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. The time has not yet come. The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. When the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai, why are you living in your luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? Interesting question. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what is happening to you. King James says, it's time for you to consider or think about where you're at. You've planted much, but you've harvested a little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but they cannot keep you warm. Your wages disappear as though you're putting them in your pocket that is filled with holes. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what is happening to you. King James says, consider your ways. We could just say la there for a minute. I want all of us to consider our ways. What are you doing? What am I doing? What are you thinking about? Who are you associating with? Because he's going to go on and he's going to ask the priesthood about defilement. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening. Consider your ways. Now go up into the hills and bring down timber. Rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought the harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins. Remember now, you are the temple. Put the context of the New Testament. You are the New Testament temple. How is your temple doing right now, the temple of the Most High God. Why? Because this temple is in ruin. Why are you so busy building your fine houses? Is it because that the heaven, it is because of this that the heaven has withheld its due and the earth produces no crop? I have called you, I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and the grapes and the olive trees and for all your crops drought to starve you and livestock and to ruin everything that you've worked to get. Oof. Why? Sometimes he brings us low to bring us up. To let him know that he's the God of the production. You think you're all this in a bag of chips and you're all so smart? Guess what? He's, no. Then Zerubbabel, son of Jeltiel, and Jeshua, son of Jehozakot, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God's people began to obey the message. That's good. So you raise up a prophet He tells them what's going on and why they're having this. You consider your ways. And then he says, they began to hear the word. And they began to do something about the word. When they heard the words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord their God had sent, the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. See, he watched them start. They began, and the Lord says, now I am with you. Remember, there's a place that says, I don't uh, forsake small beginnings, right? So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, of Shelter, the governor, and the enthusiasm of the priest. Man, when you can get the government and the church all excited about one thing, that'd be pretty awesome. He says, the enthusiasm and the whole remnant of God got excited, and they began to work on the house of their God, the Lord of Heaven's army, on September 21st, on the second year of King Darius' reign. Chapter 2, then on October 17th of that same year, the Lord sent another message through the prophet Haggai. Say this to Zerubbabel. So he's watching. He sends another message to the governor and to the high priest and the remnant of God's people. Does anyone remember this house, the temple, and its former splendor? Do you remember Solomon's temple? That's why I believe he was there. How in comparison does it look to you now? What you're building and what was before, how do you compare these two? Does it look to you now? It seems like nothing at all. But now the Lord says, be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Jeshua, son of Josiah, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. 
And now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's army. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt. So do not be afraid. See, what they were saying is the discouragers came in and said, this isn't as a splendor as what Solomon had. This spirit man that's within you, it's not about buildings. It's not about edifices and all the beauty of the edifice. It's about the Holy Spirit present in the house. That's why it's not how much money and how, what nice clothing you're wearing. How's the Holy Spirit doing in the temple here, right here? That's what he's saying is, look, the Lord looks at the heart. He doesn't look at all that other stuff. If you're spending all your tithes and offerings on all that. Wait a second. And then you want to get discouraged because it's not as beautiful as what other building down the road or was before? It's not it. That's a good word. We ought to need to get a hold of that one, right? It says, then he goes on, he says this. For this is what the Lord of heaven's army, verse 6, in a little while I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the treasures of the nations will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with the glory of the Lord of heaven's army. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, and heaven's army, the future glory of this temple will be greater than the glory of the past says the Lord's heaven's army, and in this place I will bring peace, and I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. See, those who start walking, this thing is starting. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit's presence is coming in a way that those who are part of this remnant are going to have a future glory that is going to be greater than all the past. I love what Ron's been sharing. Looking at those past revivalists, they inspire me what they contended for. But we've got promises. If you heard the prophecy from Dutch Sheets a few weeks ago, the lion of the tribe of Judah has got his paw on the United States. And it's about to be poured out. Those who seek him, those who find out, consider your ways. Where are your defilements? What are you doing? What are you doing with your temple? Who are you hanging with? What are you thinking about? What are you putting your hands to? And when we touch those things in the spirit realm, then he says, I'm with you. Get to work. Go on then, right? It's like, woo. Verse 10, he says, on December 18th of the second year, King Darius' reign, the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai. So here's message number three. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Ask the priest. See, once they started and the thing has begun and the Lord's starting to pour out, I'm with you, then he can start working on the secret sin, the things that make defilements. This is what he's saying. Go ask the priesthood this question. If one of you is carrying some meat from the holy sacrifice in his robes, and his robes happen to brush against some bread or stew, wine or olive oil, or any other thing of the food, will it become holy? In other words, if you take the holy thing and you touch it, does it become holy? The priest said, no. Then Haggai asked this question. If someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person and then touches these foods, will the food be defiled? And the priest said, yes. Interesting. You can't take something that is unclean and make it holy. He can make it holy. And so, remember in Romans, over and over again, he goes, I have become the righteousness of Christ by the blood that was shed. You have become the righteousness of Christ. And so, it says, I'm giving you a promise. Let me back up here. It says, Haggai responds, this is how, verse 14, this is how it is with the people of this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. See, sin has, there's the nature of sin, but then there's the fruit of sin. The nature, the sin nature that just wants to, and then there's all the, what happens when you dabble in it, the consequences that happen with it. He says, look at what is happening to you. Consider your ways. King James says, and now I pray, consider from this day forward before a stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. When you hoped for 20 bushels of crops, you harvested only 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you found only 20 I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything that you worked so hard to produce. And so you refuse to return to me, says the Lord. Think about this. 18th day of December of this day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, when they began. Think carefully. I am giving you now a promise. Now while the seed is still in the barn, 
You have not yet harvested your grain. And your grapevines and the trees and the pomegranates, the olive trees have not yet produced their crop. From this day onward, I will bless you. See, it's not works. It's not works righteousness. You start working and make God happy and then he'll do all these things. But he recognizes the heart after him. And he says, when you obeyed the prophetic word and began, when you laid the foundation, I decided the seed you got in your barn, it's going to produce so much fruit. Guess what? I've decided I'm going to just bless you. I like what you're doing to bless me. Go back to our vision as a hospital, as a mission house. This is the place where we, carrying the bandages and carrying the, the towel to help people, that's where the Lord says, I just keep me pouring stuff into them. Come on, make this guy give this and the tractor trailer come in from, how, from, from Florence recovery and we go out in the woods and help people cut trees off their houses and they're just like, who are you people? We're from Jesus' house. <laughs> I'm getting a pain right here. Somebody have a left knee problem? Anybody got a left knee problem anywhere in the house? One? Any others? Two? Just receive it right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you're the God that heals. Put your hand on it right now. Lord, heal the left knee. Heal knees in general. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay. It's gone for me. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right, moving right along, let's finish. Verse 20, on the same day, December 18th, the Lord sent this second message to Haggai. Tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, that I'm about to shake the heavens. Anybody know a scripture in the New Testament talks about I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken? Yes. Hebrews. This is a prophetic message about shaking that's coming. I will shake everything. And this is a prophetic message from Haggai that speaks of the, fu for fu the future coming of Christ. Look at what happens. I'm going to use Zerubbabel's DNA line to become the Messianic line. Wow. On the same day, this message tells Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, I'm about to shake the heavens. I will overthrow the royal thrones, destroy the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overturn their chariots and riders. The horses will fall and their riders will kill each other. But when, the, when this happens, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will honor you, Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, my servant. I will make you a signet ring on my finger, says the Lord, for I have chosen you. The Lord of heaven's armies have spoken. You look at the DNA chapter, Matthew chapter 1. He's in there prophesying that he would be the lineage of Christ. Now, this is wild. This is just... It's just a prophetic message. So now, let me land this thing, remaining few minutes. Turn to the outline for year 2019. So we've got the foundation of our big vision of loving God and loving people and walking in the Spirit, and that we are the temple, a family, a school, and a hospital, and an army. But now, I, this is what I think is relevant, I believe the Lord revealed to me, for us this year. And you, if you've not listened to Dutch Sheets' prophecy that he got from the woman from Australia that we prayed, played here two weeks ago. Go online and get it. Just look up Dutch Sheets and you'll, you'll get the prophecy. But I believe if you consider that, the way we got that, it came through intercessory prayer on a morning. <laughs> Kathy was there and Kathy said, we need to hear this. Um, Kathy Vinsek, and we listened to it and I said, whoa. And that, I believe, parallels what what Haggai was saying. How is this relevant for us today? Consider where we are. First of all, the nation is in a turmoil mess right now, right? Actually, we are, as a, as a people group, we're actually pretty good. I mean, yes, there's, we've got our troops deployed, but um, the economy, when you look at all of the numeric, numerics of how you might measure, unemployment is down, things, there's still a lot of trouble, but the turmoil and the chaos, because I believe that this Cyrus has got his finger on places that the enemy does not like. I believe we're going to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Yes. I believe we're going to see it. You know, we, if, if, if Ginsburg were to leave office, her Supreme Court seat, and he gets a third pick, what a, if that was anything like Kavanaugh's situation, good Lord. 
This is a spiritual fight. We're not wrestling flesh and blood here. This is a spirit. That's why it's so, oh, right? It is such a mess everywhere. And I'm not, we need to hear the spirit on it. We need to walk in the spirit because not everything that's happening is God, but everything that's not happening. So we just need to keep praying for the president, for the Congress, all that's going down, immigration, all of these things that are before us. But I believe that if we will continue to consider our ways. So where are we as a body? Here's the request. We're going to start a fast. Those who would like to join, you have a little insert in your bulletin. Did we get those in there this morning, right? We're going to do a 21-day fast if you'd like to join us. I'd like to. Joel says, call a corporate fast. And part of this fasting from... January 2nd, so you enjoy your New Year's Eve, uh, the meal. <laughs> enjoy that, whatever you're, and then uh, most of us would be okay with 21 days, all right? I know I will be. We'll go to the 23rd of January, and maybe some longer. You decide what it is that you're going to fast. Consider your ways is number one here. If you look at the outline, Haggai 1 says, consider your ways. It's also in, in uh, Haggai uh, 2.15. Consider your ways. So I would suggest, I don't know if you're a journaler, but it might be good to just sit down, get a piece of paper, get quiet with the Lord, and say, Lord, can we, can we talk for a little bit here? Let me consider my ways. How is this temple doing right now? Where am I walking? Do I have any defilements, Lord? Right? Is there anything that doesn't please you? David said, is there anything that displeases you, Lord? And he waited. And guess what? The Holy Spirit, you ask. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. He'll, 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 he'll show you. And most of us know right away, yes, I probably shouldn't be doing that. I, I know that's not a good thought. Oh, yeah, I judge and angry about this and bitter about that. And Let the Lord just speak to you. Consider where you are. So where are you? How is your walk with God? I heard at the funeral yesterday, I put a little twist on this, but I think it's really... I don't like funerals, but I like funerals because there's this place where you just get really, really real. The two greatest questions the pastor asked yesterday, I put a little spin on them. The two greatest questions you'll ever ask yourself, number one, where are you going to spend eternity? Where will you live in eternity? Second question, which is probably the answer to the first question is, what do you believe and what are you doing with Jesus? Where will you spend eternity? What do you believe? Because the devils believe Jesus is the Son of God. But they're not doing what Jesus said. So anybody who's sitting in the church saying, oh, yeah, I believe, I believe, I'm going. You might want to consider your ways. And so consider your ways. Get with the Lord and say, look, here we are, Lord, and I'm in this fast. Then listen and obey the word of the Lord. Read, start reading the scriptures. Read them afresh. It's, it's just, it just happens. When you start, do a self-Bible study. It don't have to be long. You could read a partial chapter a day. Get a, go out and buy, go to Lifeway, go to one of the online things, and get a journal and get a devotional. I like Jennifer LeClaire's. My wife and I use Jennifer LeClaire's one on the Holy Spirit. It's a, it gives you three, verse, three scriptures a day and a theme. You will not believe how that thing lines up with where we're walking. Amazing. It's amazing. God, I need to hear from you. Oh, okay. You asked me? Good. I'll, let me show you. <laughs> Woo. Get with the, do something that gets you in the Word. And then he says, now get to work. If you're sitting on the sidelines, you need to get off the sidelines, get off the bench, and get in the game. Amen. There are people out there that need what you have. It could, be, it could be small things. It's not, remember I shared last week, it's not about all the big things you do. It could be the one who serves in the nursery or cleans the church. If that's what God has told you to do, the pay is the same to those who started in the morning and those who started five minutes before sundown. Do the will of God and do it. He says, I'm with you now. Get to work. And then would you join with us? We want this place to be filled with glory. This morning, I, my wife and I both had a restless 
sleep last night. I don't know what that was. But just before I got up this morning, I was in a dream, and we were in this setting, and we were calling out to God. We were asking Him, for this year, God, what do you want? And one, one person... I want to see 100 people saved at one time in the church. Yes, amen, amen. And we're, we're just, Lord, let the healing start. Let the healing start. That's my prayer. Lord, why don't we get excited about what's happening out there and bring it here. Those that are at House of Mercy, come there. You will find people that you can pray for at House of Mercy on Thursday. I guarantee. Maybe you've never shared at House of Mercy. Call Christine. Shared the Bible study on House of Mercy in the morning before. When we used to have them hang outside. Well, now we said, well, we'll bring you over to cafe, and we'll have coffee and donuts for you over there, and we'll have the Word. Would you like that to happen? Sometimes there's only two, three, four, five to show up. But guess what? God is sowing. There are so many ministries to be part of. The prayer time. If we want to see Roe v. Wade go down, see Terry and, and Mary Esther. And prayer time over at the Planned Parenthood facility. There's, come on, guys, we, Pastor Willie could use some help maybe in the jailhouse. Anyway, just ask the Lord. Lord, what is it do you want me to do? What is it part of the ministry that I'm to serve others and you in this process? I guarantee you, you will be blessed. So I'm giving you this promise. He said, while the seed is still in the barn. So I don't know what seed you're carrying right now. But the Lord said, he'll bless it. Just give him this. Don't eat your seed, right? Some people come and they, they want to spend their seed. His seed, your tithes and offerings are seed. Don't eat it, okay? Give it to him and let him multiply a hundred, hundredfold. I'm just telling you, this is the way it works. All right. The prophetic message from Haggai in summary is build God's temple and you're the temple. Number two, consider your ways. Are you disinterested, are you discouraged, or are you dissatisfied? If those are where you are, then there's something you need to do. Consider any unclean things that are going on in your thoughts and your activities. The blessings can't be earned. The blessings can't be earned. By, here's another way of looking at this, that, that whole priesthood exchange there that happened about defilements. Just because you live in Israel doesn't make you blessed. Hello? Just because you come to church doesn't make you blessed. You can find the blessing there. You can be part of that blessing, every joint supplying. But this is a personal act, and then it's a corporate follow that comes. And when a corporately, we started out this morning, I don't know how many of you were late, no condemnation, but we started out. It was like, holy moly, where is everybody? And, it, and you could feel this like heaviness as soon as the corporate worship started. And we, I mean, it just, did, did y'all feel that? It was like, wow, yay God. And so there's something about two or three gathering in my name coming together. So there's this place of come. It can't be earned, the blessings. But when it comes together, he promises, I will bless when brethren dwell together in unity. One of our young men read this this morning in, in our pre, pre-service prayer, I, in that Psalm 133. I will command a blessing when brethren dwell together in unity. Come together in a corporate setting, all excited to worship him, and he will pour out this blessing. And then he said, I'm going to make it so that your eye hasn't seen and God hasn't shared everything except for those who love him, what he's got planned for them. So... Let me, let me end by calling out what we're going to do on the corporate prayer, a uh, corporate fast. If you would join with me on January 2nd, we'll go 21 days. You ask the Lord what it is. Some it might be media. You know, I'm going I'm to put away my, my media stuff for 21 days. Um, others, it could be food or a combination thereof. You know after you've considered your ways i got to tell you, I'll just be transparent for a minute. You know, I get this automatic update on my iPhone, and uh, YouTube would pop up. When I would look at YouTube, there is so much vile garbage. I'm telling you, there's vile garbage on YouTube. And if you read that stuff, well, I don't want to open it. You don't even have to open it. That's part of the devil's plan. It pops up. 
You start viewing that stuff, and you, you pay attention to what's going on in your spirit, man. You, you watch it. That's the discernment. So you may have to decide, look, the other thing is, you know, I like a good war movie. You know, Jonathan and I have talked. We, you know, we're like, Rawr! But I realize when I try to find a decent one, it's hard to find a decent movie where there's adventure and all this, right? And so my wife and I have been watching Hallmark after Hallmark or Up Movies or Pure Flix. And I got to tell you, we go to bed, it's like, ha. Ah. You watch that other stuff, I'm guaranteed. And you know what? It's progressive. Young people, it is progressively. The last 20 years, it is progressively. This is a fight for the spirit of our nation. It is so progressively vile and evil. The wickedness, the cutting people up and all the... Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. This is... And if you're caught in the middle of this thing, you don't realize this, but we who have been around a while say, this is really a downward spiral. Consider your ways... And so, ah, join with me in this fast because I believe after that, we're going to come together. And if we have been diligent in that, something I think Karina said last prayer meeting was, what would happen if we had a diligent church whose oil lamps were full? That just stayed with me. It's like, a diligent church whose lamps are full. Oh, if we'll do this together... I believe this next season that we're in, we're going to see amazing things happen for us. So let's stand and we'll be dismissed. I just want to, ministry team, come on up front and worship team, please come. And I just want to pray. That there'll be a new hunger, a new level of that hunger. Um, one request. Um, Rebecca and Clemente, uh, you know Clemente from our Spanish church and his wife Rebecca, she had a major break in her foot. I mean, serious break in her foot. It was Christmas Day. Um, we're raising up meals. We want to take meals. If she can't get around, she's going to have to have surgery. And so they've been such a powerful uh, encourager to us. And so if you, I think it was a couple of slots left, maybe three. If, uh, if you're able to help out with a meal there, would you see... Uh, Karina or C. Amber, Amber Thornton, and we'll arrange that. Uh, it's, it's awesome when we come together to help others out. And so, But you just kind of, if you would with me, just kind of stretch your hands out. I just want to ask the Holy Spirit that he would bring revelation to, to, to all of us. What are the things that you want to share with us, the secrets that you want to share with us? Lord, we want to be a people that know where we're eternally headed and those who did the will of the Father. So Lord, would you bring through dreams and vision and revelation through the word, through prophetic unctions, through prayer. God, you know what you want everyone here to be involved with this year. So I ask you to invade our space and make it clearer to us. And then even if we just lay the foundation that's where you come in. When we start and we get going, you then come in and reveal more. That's just the way it seems to work. So, Lord, I thank you for these that have come and made so much of Global River a fun place to be together. God, I thank you the message this morning in our worship about caring and forgiving and love keeps no record of wrongs. That's good for all of us who have ever messed it up repeatedly or gone in place. Just, God, I thank you that it's under the blood for the glory of God. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just amaze us this year with many, many salvations coming in, with many, many being healed. Lord, I just want to see cancers disappear. I, it saddens me when I, when I see those that have battled through, like Marilyn Anderson and how she fought for so many years. And God, give us the grace, healing, anointing that would flow. Deliverance, Lord, all those that are, that are calling or coming that need deliverance for their children or loved ones. God, I pray this would be an amazing year where you equip your people to do blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And we'll present that to you as an offering. 
So I thank you, Lord. I bless each one here. Let your face shine upon them and give them peace today. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. We'll see you Wednesday night. We won't be here, but we'll be back starting the book of Revelation the following Wednesday night. Enjoy the new year, everyone. Your